Hi, everybody. Welcome to Kensington Connect week six. Uh, my name is Connor Duncan, and I am from Kensington Park Senior Living. We want to welcome you to this event. We've had a great series so far. We're nearing the end, and today's a really special episode. It is all about trends in travel. And today we have Guido Adelfio, who's the owner of Bethesda Travel Center. Uh, 2021 is the 60th anniversary of Bethesda Travel Center. His parents founded it in 1961. And I'm very pleased to have him here today to share about his experience with travel, some of the trends he's been seeing, as well as the impact that he's had, that COVID has had on travel. Um, so I hope you all enjoy. If you have any questions, please feel free to write in the chat box. Thank you for being here. Uh, and we wanna pass it over to Guido. Thank you. Connor, do you hear me? Yep, we can hear you, but we can't see you yet. Oh, what about there this? There you go. Perfect. Hi, that's me. I'm Guido. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, we have, um, I'm sure that uh, people are familiar with the area know where we are. We're on East West Highway, and we're just next to where there used to be a McDonald's across from BCC High School. And We've been here for a very long time and we have a thriving business. We specialize in customized vacations for couples and uh, family groups primarily. We recently did, um, Doug and Barbara went to Italy and had a great time. So I was happy to work with them and they introduced me to Connor. And a couple of years ago, we had a chance to give, or I had a chance to give a talk for a Rotary Club. And so at that time, I decided to put together a PowerPoint so that people could follow along. And it also helped me a lot in terms of collecting my thoughts because I'm doing travel all day long. And if you never stop and take a little step back and get a feeling for what you're doing, it's very hard to articulate what it is that you do. So I made a PowerPoint called Trends in Travel. I don't have to tell you how COVID changed the projection of trends in travel. And so what I like to do is go through these slides and talk about uh, just how, how I see it, what's happening now, what will happen in the future. And I was very much inspired by Kate and Ashley's talk about the Impressionists, specifically Van Gogh. So I put a little aspect of art history on it too, because a properly done trip, and again, we do primarily Europe, we do primarily Italy and France, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, a little bit uh, Czech Republic, um, Budapest, Prague, things like that, but primarily Italy and France. And so if you have a trip, my kind of motto is if you have a trip with a purpose, it's always going to be a better trip. So I threw in a little bit of art because I think everyone likes it and it picks up on what the previous presenters did so well. Now I, I discarded the idea of doing the wine because what were their names? Davis and Matt. They did a great talk about whiskey, but it's a little early in the day for that. So we'll stay with Impressionist Art. And uh, that's me. I was younger then. Can you see the mouse uh, moving on the screen? Yes, we can. Okay, because every now and then I'll refer to that. Uh, and off we go. Uh, so what did I do? I was able to go to Italy and France last fall. And I was able to make a little video for some of my uh, clients to see. And if you don't mind, I'll share it with you. Here we go. It's, it's under three minutes, so you won't get bored. Hi, it's Guido. Just back from three weeks in Europe, refreshing our product, meeting our suppliers, seeing the hotels, and getting ready for the new normal. And I wanted to share with you some of my experiences. Here we go.
that is the best ice cream cone of the day, but possibly the best ice cream cone of my life. This is a good one. Thank you from all of us at Bethesda Travel. We can't wait to plan your next trip to Europe once things get going again. And I don't know if everyone realizes, but I call that work. So here we are with um, some ideas about travel. Uh, some of these are pre-COVID. I don't know if you can see that on the screen, but it says pre-COVID economy 2019. Uh, travel is roughly, uh, the broad definition of travel is roughly 10% of the world's economy. It's a major part of US export. And also there's a major presence of small businesses in travel. And we had foreseen at the time continued travel, continued expansion, just like these graphs show, wealth, consumer interests and lifestyle, attitudes and expectations. Also peace and prosperity. And by the way, good health, which changed everything. Uh, what happened then after in 2020 was what you see here on that tan line. It dropped dramatically. And I think uh, probably I'm talking to a lot of people that share this sentiment. Everyone is excited to go again to get started traveling. But for the moment, we're waiting for the vaccine to be widely distributed and have a sense of confidence. So what's here on the left? There's the travel basically is a dichotomy. You have corporate and business travel, and that got hammered just as bad as leisure travel with COVID. It's probably coming back very slowly. And I know people that make their life out of um, conventions. They make their living off of trade shows, things like that. That's all stopped for the foreseeable future. Then you have leisure travel, which is what we do. There's a lot of subsets of leisure travel. There's family travel, destination weddings, educational travel. Sometimes it's uh, alumni groups, or it might be a junior year abroad. Uh, you got just the straight up holiday, staycation, events, World Cup, Wimbledon, anything like that. Um, there's faith-based travel. People do what's called volunteerism to countries to do um, uh, projects with their local community. Sustainable travel is a catchword. And then a thing called doc tourism. Believe it or not, a lot of people go overseas for medical treatments. And then what I do, which is what I basically call uh, it's all about the experience, cultural travel. And you can see from these pictures, I hope many of you have visited uh, these countries. These are, um, uh, we work uh, Europe-wide, also in Israel. And a sad note, if anyone has been in the Washington DC for area for a while, I just remembered that, uh, we used to work, do a lot of work with WMAL, with Hardin and Weaver, Bill Mayhew, Felix Grant, all the great celebrities on WMAL. And this lovely lady is Janice Ockershausen. She was married to Andy Ockershausen. And a uh, very sad note, Andy Ockershausen, who anyone who's been around Washington for the past 40, 50 years will remember him. And he passed away yesterday. So a little prayer for our friend Andy Ockershausen. That was in Israel, by the way, that picture. So what's the history of leisure travel? In the ancient times, the classical Greeks and Romans traveled. Now they were the kings, they were the high royalty, but they traveled for reason of what we call today leisure. And then when the, the European economy stopped through the Renaissance, there wasn't travel. And then it started again, basically in the late 1700s, 18th century. We're talking about the nobility that went on trips. Example, if you go to Lake Como in Italy, and by the way, it's not Lake Cuomo, it's Lake Como, C-O-M-O. In Bellagio, there's a beautiful botanical garden with 220 year old redwood trees, other items that were brought back by a local count who was hobby was botany. He brought back seedlings from Siberia, from uh, United States, different parts of the world and planted them in the 1780s. And they're still growing today. It's an amazing thing. That's part of the beauty of, of Lake Como. Then the 19th century started to be more of a, a popular item, including um, uh, there was the advent of photography, magazines, steamship, Mark Twain, things like that caught the popular imagination. 
we came to the 20th century, the great invention, the aircraft, which then um, caught the public imagination, Charles Lindbergh, Amelia Earhart, then came the warriors. And following the warriors is what was sort of the golden age of travel. There were new means of communication, faster aircraft. Remember Arthur Frommer, Europe on $5 a day. People really truly did that. I had a client, he told me he graduated medical school and they went to Europe with a bunch of friends. And get this, they spent less in Greece so they would have more money left for Paris. They were existing in Greece under $5 a day. It's, you can't even do coffee on $5 a day now, but at the time that was a big push for travel. Uh, rising middle class, leisure time, the glamour of it, steamship travel, and then 1960s, um, the jet aircraft 707, it came out in 58, and the 747 came out in 1970. We all, I'm sure everyone here remembers those states. Highways, trains, uh, it was a glamorized event, and families went to Europe. It was something that everyone wanted to do. Then comes the 20th, 21st century, the 2000s. And now we have what? Uh, affluent, sophisticated travelers. They're looking for stimulating experiences. They want no stress and they want to have fun, romance, comfort. There's a strong interest in non-mainstream destinations. So they're varying the destinations. They're not just all going to the same place. And as I mentioned before, it's an expectation for a lot of people, travel is a lifelong pattern. It's a hobby. When I started working in the late seventies, there were clients who had been to Europe, possibly in the army, but hadn't been back. And they were retiring in their sixties, do a trip to Europe, TWA getaway vacations, 12 countries in 10 days and come home. And that was their trip to Europe. My clients now have been to Europe basically almost every year of their life. A lot of my clients have visited more countries than their age. That's a major generational shift in 40, 50 years. Uh, what else are the elements that contribute to what we're talking about? There's affluence, prosperity. You have a healthy, energetic, aging population. There's a lot more social media, a lot more technology, and we have access to new means of transport. When I was in my 20s, if you flew within Europe, it was a $1,200 plane ticket. Now you've got Ryanair and um, EasyJet and for 40, 50 euro, you can fly somewhere. It would have been unheard of 40, 50 years ago. There's um, different types of accommodation. There's basically something for everybody. Uh, the dollars remain strong, the eagerness to explore. And a lot of people do theme trips and there's um, importance, uh, safety, security and good health. And by the way, uh, we aren't the only ones in lockdown. In Europe, they're in definite lockdown. And what I thought about when I heard the presentation, which was so excellent on Van Gogh, was that the people in the museums are bored too. They don't even have any visitors. So they're out for a little walk. You've got uh, Van Gogh and the girl with the pearl earring taking a walk in the Netherlands. Now, what made me think about uh, travel is related to the Impressionists was that a lot of artists took great inspiration when they traveled. And here we have a few quotes. Monet said, all I did was to look at the what the universe showed me to let my brush bear witness. Picasso said, I don't seek, I find. He's, he was an explorer. Uh, Van Gogh, I walked the earth for 30 years and out of gratitude, gratitude I want to leave some souvenir. And Matisse said, an artist is an explorer. And this is, as I'm sure you know, the um, gardens of Monet at Giverny. It's about an hour outside of Paris going into Normandy. And last year when I went to France, guess what? I got to take a picture. That's my picture. And that's Monet's work of art. Well. Can anything be better than could go somewhere that you have an interest in and stand right on the place where Monet cultivated his gardens and faithfully recorded it with his paintings? Claude Monet, I'm not comparing myself to Monet, but this is my picture. I got to go to that exact place. And by the way, you can too. And then what else do we have? Uh, and R, oh, there's the bridge. This is uh, Vincent van Gogh, 1888. 
Greedo Adelfio with my, this is a cell phone camera, by the way, 2018. I got to stand in exactly the same place where he stood. Also where the yellow house is. It was destroyed in the war, but you can see the exact place where it was. And some of his paintings show the background that you see right there when you stand there in Arles. Arles is in uh, Provence in Southern France. The other one that I think is very striking is how artists change their technique, change their palette as they travel. So this is one example is Picasso. He went to, uh, I believe it was in the 40s, he went to Lascaux. Lascaux is in south central France, uh, basically southwest, and they are, they are the caves. These were not Neanderthal, they were human beings that painted spectacular um, rendition of bulls and other animals too. And then guess what Picasso did? When he went there, he came away, he said, in 15,000 years, we have invented nothing. And he changed his technique. And if you, I'm sure everyone here has seen it, how he just, um, how, how he did the lithograph of the bull, he basically uh, took the elements of the bull right down to its basic element. He deconstructed the bull from this through stages to this. And that was after he saw what had been underground for 1500 years until they discovered it in the 40s. They lost their dog and he went down in the cave and they went and looked for the dog and they found the paintings, amazing story. And then we have um, one of my favorites, which is Matisse. Matisse went to, he was frozen in, in 1907. He couldn't paint, he had the equivalent of a writer's block. And he went to Italy on vacation, which is always a good idea. He went to Padova, which is about an hour, a little bit less, 45 minutes from Venice. And he visited the frescoes of Giotto in the Scrovegni Chapel. And he totally changed his composition of his paintings and the color palette. And he picked up the blue from the sky that, that uh, was so difficult for Giotto because in the time, in the, in the 600 years before, they had to use lapis, which is a semi-precious stone. I believe they, they mined it in Persia, modern day Iran and Iraq. And then they ground it up and put it in the fresco. And then Monet, I'm sorry, Matisse had the advantage that in the 1840s, they started developing paint in tubes. So technology also drives these equations, technology and travel. They could paint outdoors. They didn't have to any longer paint uh, inside in a studio. And prior to going to Padova, Matisse painted like this. And then once he went to Padova, he painted like this on the right. So you can see it's a dramatic shift of technique. Those things only happen when you travel. Back to Matisse before he went to Giotto. And then now we have um, some things that, that people travel for, not just to view art, but for participatory art. It could be in Verona in Italy in the summer, they have the festival of the opera in the first century uh, uh, Roman amphitheater. And then up here you have um, Cristo. I'm sure everyone's heard of Cristo. He does this magnificent outdoor art. I think he passed away about two years ago. But um, this was in North Italy. He created this floating pier and people were able to walk on it. And it's an art form, but it's participatory. It's something tactile. You can really experience it. Then we go to another reason that people travel. A lot of people like to go for a painting workshop or photography workshop, that type of things. There's not only one reason to travel. And the other thing, again, going back to the idea of technology, how it changes things, uh, this is a Van Gogh interactive exhibit and it's all about the technology. And I believe I'm correct, this is coming to Washington sometime in the near future. So keep an eye out for that. And once again, technology changes everything including in our field because on travel, these are all companies that didn't exist before maybe 2010, 2007, something like that it has changed everything. And in terms of me as a professional, I have to create a clearly defined niche. And my niche is 
couples or families. Uh, fairly upscale trips, not the tippy top private jets, then Bentleys, things like that, but definitely Mercedes level trip, Lexus. And the high end traveling public expects someone like me to be specialized, up to date. I have to know the places. Pre COVID, I went to Europe basically seven, eight, up to 10 times a year. Uh, level of sophistication, you have to understand the lifestyle. And the expectation is to have basically a concierge style service. And then uh, what it's all about, once again, the experience, people want culture, history, art, food and wine. We could do wine another day if you like. Uh, active vacations, people are more and more active and then they love to have the adventure. There's a lot of, and then we do a number of trips like this, multi-generational family travel that you could have the grandparents, the, the middle generation, the grandchildren all together for an anniversary, something like that. People really, really enjoy those trips. And then special events could be a wedding, once again, an anniversary, anything like that. And uh, the future, it's always right around the corner. We're waiting for COVID to lift the vaccine. My, my wife and I both got vaccinated. Uh, Europe's a little behind where we are. But, um, and there's some controversy now with the AstraZeneca, but the Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, Moderna are being widely distributed. And hopefully before too long, we'll be traveling again very soon back to Europe and doing all these great things. And that's basically uh, what I have to say going forward, you know, there are gonna be new technologies. This is a family that had the 50th anniversary in Assisi, in Umbria, we love Umbria. And people, media, people have expectations. They've got Rick Steve, Bourdain, everyone's watching Stanley Tucci, Travel and Leisure. There's all kinds of interesting content on, um, on uh, Amazon Prime, or every, whatever you stream, you can find lots of stuff. I've been watching a series on the Silk Road talking about travel to Turkey and the Stans and Iran, Iraq into China is fantastic. And so at this moment in time, I would like to entertain any questions that anyone might have. And I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you, Guido. We do have some questions. So someone watching was wondering, what about travel for singles? Uh, you know, they might not have a family. They'd like to sort of see the world. What do you recommend? And do you have any experience with that? Uh, I do have some, yes. Typically for singles, if when you go just by yourself, it's not as much fun. You're not sharing with other people. And um, I travel a lot by myself. You go to the restaurant, you're kind of in the corner reading the newspaper on your cell phone. You're not really interacting. Part of why you travel is to interact. So how do you solve that? There are some very, very good organized group tours that work very well for seniors. Uh, you have um, Rick Steve has a whole series of tours. People for singles, I meant to say. Rick Steve has a very good series of tours all over Europe. Uh, and then you have companies such as Talk Tours. You may have heard of that. And sometimes uh, going on a cruise is a nice way to do that too, uh, because there's a built in way to interact with other people. And then we had a question about um, someone is wondering, do you plan any local trips in the United States or is it just abroad? We only work with Europe. Uh, we do a little tiny bit in South America and Asia and uh, very, very little within the US. Now, if you want to call, I can play 20 questions with anyone. I, I was sort of, when I was trained in the field, I was trained as a generalist. So I learned to kind of do a little bit of everything, but in terms of what Bethesda Travel offers to our clients, it's overseas, uh, primarily Europe, and once again, a little tiny bit in South America or Asia, or uh, also Africa, safaris, some such as uh, Botswana, South Africa, that is a great experience. Can you talk a little bit more about your training and sort of how you came into this role and also about your parents? I know it's the 60th anniversary of Bethesda Travel this year. Oh, well, thank you. My father was Italian. He's passed away about 10 years ago. My mother is American. She's a Maryland girl from Sandy Spring. 
And they met totally by accident. My mother uh, graduated from Wellesley College right after the war. And she was going to Paris with a friend to have kind of the Paris experience. My father had been in the Italian Air Force trained in Canada. And he realized Sicily was a small place. He was thinking about widening out his horizons. So he went to law school and he was on a uh, semester break in Capri. And my mother on the way to Paris in those days, it was steamship and the ship stopped in Capri. And so I'm very fond of Capri because no Capri, no Guido. And then they, uh, over a period of four or five years, they married here in, in um, Maryland in 1954. They went back to Italy. I was born in 1955. And within three years, came back to this side when we went to Montreal. And my very first memories are in Montreal. And then my father finished his uh, law degree. He got a master's. And then we came here. He worked in a law firm for a time. And then that wasn't working out very well. I think he was trained in the Napoleonic Code and we use common law in the United States other than Louisiana. And my mother didn't like the winters in Canada or he might have stayed there. And uh, what happened next, he went to work for Air France. And then there was a promotion, the way I heard it, I was a small child, there was a promotion and the Italian guy got the same desk and the French guy got promoted. So he said, this isn't for me, I'm going to start my own business. And that was 1961. John Kennedy was just in office. It was a time of great exuberance. And we started our business then. I was six years old. So when I was growing up, Bethesda Travel was the fifth sibling at the dinner table. It's all my parents talked about. Well, I got a whole education at the dinner table. And then when I graduated from college, I came and started working. And my father was great because he let me make all my own mistakes. So I've already made every mistake I could possibly make. And I learned from that. And it was really good that he didn't try to like micromanage me. He let me create, he let me do it. And we're still here doing it. Thank you for sharing that. What uh, are you kind of predicting or maybe thinking you'll see, you know, in the next six months as travel picks up and has it picked up already? You know, lots of folks do have vaccines now. Um, so what are you seeing right now? And, you know, what do you project kind of for the end of the year? Well, first of all, my uh, main specialty business-wise is Europe, uh, as I mentioned before. But I also have family that lives in Michigan. I have California and Florida. The one in Michigan used to live in Alaska. So I travel internally in the U.S. for family reasons. Well, guess what? I haven't seen them for several, several, several months. And once, think, once people are more vaccinated and more feeling confident, and by the way, part of the non-confidence is the people you're going to visit. They may be, don't feel confident having you come unless you stay in a hotel for five days before you come to dinner. Uh, the vaccine, I think, will change all of that and open that up dramatically. The other part is going to Europe. Now, my business is very seasonal. So we basically are operating our trips during daylight savings time. And Europe has the same latitude we do, essentially. So it matches up well. I think that, oh, and by the way, most people plan because when, I, when I'm involved, it's a fairly elaborately planned trip. People are planning a minimum of three up to five, six, seven months ahead. This year, in other words, in March, I'm already doing stuff for July, August, and September in March in a normal year. This year, I think that time frame is going to be compressed. And then as people get their shots, they're going to be calling me not three to five months ahead, three to five weeks ahead to be able to go still with the daylight savings time. I think you're also going to see a little bit of an extended season. The people that couldn't go, let's say until the third quarter, so August, September timeframe, maybe they'll even bridge it into when Europe goes off daylight savings time into November and December, Christmas week. Everyone has the urge to go to Europe. And when they watch Stanley Tucci, they really want to go is what people tell me. So. I think you're going to see a strong winter season once again, 
the vaccines are widely distributed and people feel that confidence both on the receiving end who's coming to see you as well as that you feel confident to travel and the other thing just so you know that it really upsets me sometimes when i hear the stories about people that don't comply with the flight crews or won't wear a mask on the plane or things like that please be compliant with the flight crew help them out they have a very difficult job they're on your side and always be polite to the flight crew <laughs> any other questions connor yeah, we got a couple more. So someone says that they normally book cruises from the cruise line, but can a travel agent get better prices than the cruise line? <laughs> uh, no, um, that's one of the major changes with the internet. And no, we, we pretty much have the exact same pricing as the cruise lines. Now, what does Bethesda Travel do? Because there's any number of different cruise lines. And by the way, I'm sure if you follow it, you know that they're by and large shut down too, complete shutdown. The QM2 on the Atlantic is not resuming until Thanksgiving timeframe, eight more months from now. So it's just unbelievable. And they shut down in, in March of last year. So what, what I'm saying is um, the our choice as, a, as an agency is that we work with Cunard Regent, Crystal, we work with Oceana, Asmara, uh, Windstar, we love Windstar, and that's pretty much who we work with. Anything else we don't touch. AAA sometimes can get good rates, and then there are agencies that are specialized in cruises that work with Holland America, Princess Carnival, etc. Uh, but that's our choice not to work with those. We work from, let's say, from Cunard and on up. And then we have uh, Frank wondering, just talk a little bit more about the advantages of a traveler using your service as opposed to doing it a la carte on their own. Of course. So number one, there's, as you know, from what I said before, there are all different types of trips, all different ways to travel. And some people, in other words, we used to, we pre-internet, we did a lot of travel in the Caribbean. Well, the internet made took all of that away from the, the retail agency and made it a direct sale. Ski trips, same thing. Hawaii, by and large, the same thing. But in Europe, I think it's different. So if you're someone that uh, really, really enjoys the planning process, and a lot of people do, that really enjoys uh, finding new places to go, repeat going to places you maybe haven't seen for many years, figuring out the hotel, doing cost cross comparison, riding public transportation, or just using taxis. Some places in Europe don't have Uber, but if when they have it, using Uber or Lyft, that's fine. But the, the true added value when we get involved is we like to sit down with you, talk to you, make sure that you're, what you articulate to us is what's going to happen when you're there, what your preferences are. And then it's a seamless, you know, one, one, um, one and done. We listen to you carefully and then we have suppliers. We have the network of people and we're able to hook you up with all the right people, the right amount of time in the right place for to have a great trip. The one thing I always try to remember is when you take a vacation of that nature, there's no rewind button. So if you do it wrong, you can't go back the next year and do it right the second time. You really want to do it right the first time. And then the next year you can do another trip. Similar, we have a lot of, a lot of repeat clients. But to me, the added value is that all of that planning happens for you behind the scenes. It's our main job to understand what your uh, preferences are, what you like to do, how you like to do it, and then set it up. And I saw a funny statistic once. It was something like this, that the average person spends in a year 70 hours planning vacations and planning for retirement, 18 minutes. Well, you should uh, put a little more time on the retirement and maybe a little less on the planning side and let a professional do it. I like that one. I, I heard a chuckle from our audience in the other room. <laughs> um, a couple more questions. What's the most unique place that you have visited uh, in all your years? Well, I've been, I'm trying to get to 100 countries. I've been to 85. So wow, okay. that's a very open-ended question. I believe that the 
the the one that I had the strongest takeaway was um, when I spent uh, 10 days in Botswana doing safaris. I love that. It's fantastic. Um, then in Europe, um, I like Umbria. I really love Umbria. It, it sort of has a, just all the right ingredients of everything. Power. Excuse me. Most emotional place was, uh, without a doubt, is the Normandy beaches of, of D-Day. That's a powerful experience. Wow. Anyone who hasn't been there, I strongly recommend it. And by the way, Giverny is right on the way from Paris to the Normandy beaches. Another and and uh, Connor, not to interrupt, yeah. but um, we are putting out that video that I showed you. We have a series of them that we put one out about every three weeks from when I went there last fall. Mm -hmm. And uh, coming up, we're going to try to coincide it with the D-Day anniversary but we're going to put a video out about my experience there at Normandy. Uh, our email is chao, C-I-A-O, chao at bethestatravel.com. If you send us a quick email, we'll be very happy to include you in our distribution. Absolutely. I'll put the, uh, that email in our chat box as well. Oh, thank you, Connor. Sure. Uh, and another question is, so when are you next going to Europe or traveling in general? And what is on your bucket list for travel? What's something you haven't done yet? Oh, thank you. Um, next trip, we were supposed to go to Europe April 1st, but Italy went into lockdown. My wife's birthday is April 4th, which is Easter Sunday. And that was our great dream to be able to, you know, open things up again and celebrate. But we figured out about 10 days ago, that's not going to happen. So we rebooked for Memorial Day. And the uh, other trip that I really want to go is um, I have two young grandchildren, they're toddlers, and one's in Michigan, one's in California, and I'm hoping to do that in um, the next, say, six weeks to visit both. And what would be on my bucket list? Well, again, I'm trying to get the 100th country, and, and I have a bunch of places I would like to visit. One is, believe it or not, I've never been to Malta. I was born in Sicily. I've never been to Malta. I have a daughter-in-law who's from Tashkent in Uzbekistan, which is what they all the stands. It's uh, you go to um, Iran and keep going. So we're hoping to go there hopefully this fall. And I would sort of like to start exploring the Silk Road a little bit more. Uh, I've been watching this series on on um, Amazon Prime called The Silk Road. It's excellent. So I'm really enjoying that. So that would be one bucket list item. Uh, Inland Sea of Japan, I've uh, never seen it. And to get to my hundredth country. Well, that is a great goal to have. And any more questions from anybody? I'll give you just a second. What time is it? Oh, we have a few minutes. We any more questions? Any more questions? Can I drop in Connor with your permission, a quick video? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let me get out of this screen. Minimize that. Oops, what's that? Uh, Lake Como. Not Como, it's Lake Como. I think you have to pull up. Right now, we can still see your PowerPoint. Oh. So if you go to share your screen again, you probably should, you should be able to pull up. Um, it says my screen is paused. What if I stop share and then share again? Yep, that works. Okay, now we're sh oh, share screen. So share computer sound. We're going to go there, share. We're going to maximize it. And we're going to Lake Como. Just above Milan in North Italy, near the Swiss border. And here you can really appreciate the natural beauty. A private boat is definitely the best way to see the lake. Our friend Itzio lives just over there and he tells me he doesn't need the weatherman. Just open the window each morning, get a breath of fresh lake air and check out the weather. What a life. Villa Balbionello showcases the vibrant colors and incredible lake scenery. including the lush subtropical gardens, offering what might just be the best view in Italy. So beautiful. 
friendly people and a great chance to relax and enjoy the superb scenery. Italy is waiting for you and we at Bethesda Travel are uniquely positioned to show you the very best. It really doesn't get any better than this. Lago di Como. So I call it work. <laughs> Very lucky. That was beautiful. Thank we you. do have a final question. Yes, please. Uh, do you hold ever on, organize hold a trip? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, yeah, there you can. Okay, go. Up. Yep. Do you ever organize trips to Morocco? Uh, we have in the past, yes. I've, I've been there four times. And uh, oh, yes, we'd yeah. be very happy to talk to you about Morocco. Yeah, Morocco's pretty, very popular. My brother yes, actually. Yes, it is. Your brother, is, is he still yeah. living there? <laughs> he, yeah, he still lives there. He did the Peace Corps. Uh, probably six or seven years ago, and he loved it so much and stayed and is working uh, kind of with locals. So he loves it. I met it. him in Italy. Yeah, yeah. And I've been to Morocco a couple times, so it's a beautiful country. Yes, we had a, a thank you from Marsha. She says you, she really enjoyed a You're trip. very welcome. And she says, wishing you 100 countries. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And Ellen says, thank you for allowing us to travel with you today. So I agree with that sentiment. Guido, thank you so much for all your expertise and your inspiration. Uh, I know we're all antsy to kind of get back out into the world and, and travel again. So oh, thank, thank you so you. much. And, uh, and I, Connor, you saw my, my sweatshirt, yeah. right? <laughs> you got your Italy sweatshirt on. <laughs> anyway, well, thank you so much. And You're very welcome. And enjoy uh, Europe in May. And uh, we hope to see you again soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Connor. Bye. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>